Our next speaker is a, an unusual scientist. He's been a farmer and a studier of soils and a you have your PhD in depth psychology, is that right? So now we're going to go deep into soils and deep into psyches, all in one package. Tim LaSalle. You know, I have made the case that David Johnson's research is going to help save the planet, but I, I, I think that's true, but I know he just saved my slideshow, so thank you, David. And the computer's up. And, oh. Of course. of course. Well, thank you very much. This is a, a title that Adam asked me to deal with. And I realized as he also started to talk to me on the phone about the psychology of what we're talking about that I had a few thoughts about that. And it sort of shifted a direction away from what we may say three billion years of organic agriculture uh, into where I think we can take this today. And uh, I should say, I should have worn my dung beetle shirt today. Being in South Africa for four years, the dung beetles, they're about that big, you know? They're amazing. Uh, and it showed me the value of how fast um, they could bury um, cow manure. But let me just start here by saying we remain on the path to extinction. I mean, I mean those are, that's a fact by what all of science is showing us. So as a species, we remain in a pretty consistent trajectory. And with respect to that, carbon emissions just increased again instead of where we thought they were starting to plateau. So we remain on this trajectory of extinction. So I'm going to go through kind of the known cognitive recognition of this trajectory. We know it. Two is there are solutions that exist to avert it. We know that, and we're here talking about some of those today. And then I'm going to kind of finish with why are we not acting? And this is the depth psychological perspective and a lens that I think I can offer into this discussion. Not as the answer, but another lens uh, to work with as a group here today as we're thinking about these. So a lot of these global trends have been talked about, but a report just came out saying, my goodness, we continue to lose, eliminate, extinct a lot on this planet. So we're losing the water, we're destroying the soil, we're killing species, uh, all to our own demise, of course, in this process. And I'll go through these fairly fast. But what has been coming forward is something in my presentations that are always focused on soil and how we can save our trajectory, turn our trajectory around, is there are two coming very immediate cataclysmic events for our civilization. And first is, is to look at is soil loss which isn't talked about much, but it's been talked about a little bit here today, which I'm, in the last two days, which I think is very, very important because civilization rests on soil, not just for food. Obviously, in this biodiversity seminar, we know about how important the biodiversity below ground is. You know, the amount of biodiversity be below soil level is, then reflects what we'll see above. And we can't have one without the other. They both are interactive and engaged together. But we did learn our lesson about soil loss, of course, in the Dust Bowl, and we've turned that around, right? <laughs> so this is Ray Archuleta shares these kinds of slides, reminding us that we're smart, we're intelligent, we have a cognitive awareness of this. We've changed our behavior, not so much. and. Uh, here we continue to lose soils at a very fast rate. So in this picture, I'm talking about erosion the other way. This is typically water erosion. And on the left was the field right next to my research work in Africa when I was working with Howard Buffett on soil and hunger and climate, et cetera. And that field, I just asked him to disc it once because the weeds were coming up so fast. And I didn't want all those seeds into my research plots. Oh, I felt bad about it after this rain event. You see how much soil just washed away immediately. And it was, Howard said, you know, Tim, I've got for you the best, worst soils in the world. And he actually performed on his promise. I mean, that was sand. Uh, but we really, great results there. Was doing work in Burundi uh, there as well. And all of Burundi is tilled. It's 90% agrarian. Every inch is tilled. The biodiversity has gone. I think I saw one monkey almost no birds, and this is heavy tillage agriculture, 
and results of what happens to it. This is my neighbor uh, in California, down here in his field, and I can take you right now before the rains have come in California and show you all of the tillage that's taking place getting ready to plant the grains when the rains come because they think they're opening their soil for percolation. The reason I put the picture on the left is that Doug Tompkins in Argentina took me in his plane to show me farm after farm after farm along the Paraná River, erosion on every one. And he actually, he's one of the few organic growers, was, I'm sorry he passed, but with his 6,000 acre farm there, that was committing to no-till. And that's really a crucial element that we have to get to, is move to a no-till environment to save the soil. Roland Bunch, a dear friend, first showed me regenerative agriculture in Central America in the 80s. And uh, he had written this, a number of years ago he was saying there's a coming famine in Africa where 10 to 20 million people are going to be suffering food shortage. And that happened. He actually published it in 2011. So the tragedy is rushing at us so quickly that tens of millions of people could starve within the next four or five years. He said, I missed it by two months. And he says, I'm not a climatologist. I'm, I'm not a meteorologist. This is not about rain. This famine was caused by loss of soil carbon. And so we know we're, we, part of our emission problem is loss of carbon from the soil, but now the soils in Western Africa, because of no more ability to actually set land aside and put it in a fallow and let carbon build back, the carbon was gone. And so you'd get a heavy downpour and a flood, and at the same time, a drought because no water could percolate into that sandy soil. And that happens now more and more as we're seeing we create floods because we've destroyed soil structure and we can end up with not much percolation at the same time. So we have to rebuild uh, soil organic matter. These are, are two of my, uh, one uh, on this left side is in Africa, my sandy soil a guy that we helped bring in to help us teach a bunch of seed growers from across the continent said, Tim, bring me a sample of soil from your fields. And remember, that was sand. You saw the picture of the field next, door, next to it. Well, that is this one right here. I thought if I dig that clod up, it's not going to make it in my truck up to the main office because it'll fall apart. It's just sand. But put it in water, and it aggregated. It stayed together. It did, it, that's why my fields didn't erode. This is that field that you saw next door. It immediately melted and washed away. On my home place in California right now, the same thing. This was sitting for 10 days, and that's the field I just put cover crops in. Completely aggregated, did not disintegrate. A bunch of wormholes and aggregates holding that soil together, air spaces, whereas the, my f friend next door disks his field a couple of times. It immediately disaggregated and erodes and disappears, and that's part of our problem of course, globally as to what's happening. Here is in Ghana a, an example of no-till, of why we've got to move to no-till understandings around our soil. So Kofi Boa was helping him set up some experiments, and this was one area of Ghana that had intermittent rain, two cropping seasons, and this second cropping season had a, a minimal amount of rain. In this test plot, whoops, that was the wrong button. Um, in this test plot, that is cow peas that was no-tilled one season, and this is cow peas that's typically normal tillage for the region. So you have crop failure because of tillage, actually food because of no tillage. And so this is an important element that we have to bring back into our understandings of how we build for the future. We have to stop tillage this is going to not only hold more carbon, it's going to hold soil structure. So when I was at Rodale Institute, I couldn't get them to stop plowing. And so if you look at these, these field trials that are often elevated as the great organic versus conventional discussion points, problematically, these plateaued 30 years ago on soil carbon. And it's still a tillage system. So it is not gaining. It's not building. And, and that's where we have to combine the two ideas of how we get chemicals out of the system to build biology and stop disaggregating the soil and disrupting the fungi in the process. The two have to be brought together. Now let me just shift quickly and say the other, of course, cataclysm that's happening for us is climate. 
And I only put this up here. This is from Paul Hawkins' work on drawdown. Uh, from the perspective of saying, with all due respect to Bill McKibben, we have no history telling us that 350 is a good target. And that's what our Paris Accords and everything are talking about is 350. We have no history that says that's survivable. And so we really do need to come, as Jim just talked about, back into the range of the 280. I was doing some work in India and, and uh, Nepal just recently on the agricultural burning going on. Right now it's in the news. It's killing people dramatically. The air quality in those regions, particularly exacerbated by agricultural burning, uh, complicated by diesel engines and home fires. But in essence, can you imagine like in China that you have to live completely enclosed for months at a time during the bad air times? Psychologically what that would do to you? Talk about protecting yourself from the outside world because it's actually deadly to you. That's what we are creating in this. So what's our history? What's our track record as a species? Well, this comes back into the human psyche as well. But you know, back in the 70s here at a neighboring campus, uh, Dana Meadows was trying to talk to us about limits to growth. And much of our economic models, no, OK. All of our economic models, pretty much, are disconnected from reality. So it's theory, and it's modeling, and it's equations that have nothing to do with limits, earth limits, pollution limits, regenerative, regenerative limits that are not, there's not a connection, there's not a grounding, there's not a reality, there's no reality tests in these economic models. So we're, we are, listen to our politicians, we want three or four percent growth. In other words, we want to kill ourselves faster. Let's go from two percent to three or four and get us off the planet. We, uh, Jared Diamond has certainly told, showed us examples after examples of, of collapse by cultures. Now we're doing it globally as a culture. And I just finished this book on sapiens, and it takes me into this discussion. As a species, there were five other human species on the planet, but as the sapiens moved into their region, those species disappeared. It's something about us that lays pretty deep within, and it's not necessarily by spear marks or clubs over the head that these species disappeared. But not until sapiens showed up did they disappear. On the megafauna, Jim was showing a little bit of this. When sapiens showed up, these species disappeared. And some people say, well, theoretically, that may be because of comets or some big climate change event. But that wouldn't explain why the mammoth continued to exist on an island off of Alaska until 14,000 years ago, until sapiens showed up on that island and then they disappeared too. So we don't have a good track record and we're continuing on this particular trajectory. And so what we're happening, uh, what we're seeing now, of course, is the storm intensifications and it was curious in Santa Rosa when I saw this in the newspaper. And now nature has turned her sights on us. And I thought, I think it's opposite. <laughs> I think we've turned our sights on her but so much of it is unconscious. And we know, whoops, this, this moved on me, but we know that we could turn this around. One is if we stop the black carbon, we could look at a trajectory and stop and really reduce our fossil emissions. We could turn towards this. If we turn to regenerative agriculture, we could start to move towards this direction. And Jim had some nice numbers. I want to talk to you about some of those. I think that's a great way to look at some of that. So basically, when I used to talk about carbon sequestration in 08 and 09, said we could mitigate all of it just in agriculture with grazing and with farming, was really talking about not these last two columns. I said we could do all of it just right up to this one where it says compost. And if you just did some calculations and moved to the farmland, and that was over uh, 2,300 kilograms per hectare. Well, that includes uh, basically Oops, wrong button again. A conventional no-till, winter cover crops, composting, starting to stack some practices we could move in that direction. Now we know there are some numbers, not just from what Richard Teague says, between now one and three tons per hectare, although we just had Richard in, at Chico State this last week, 
and he's really looking at the California grazing lands and saying, boy, I don't know how you guys are going to really do that out here because you don't have the water, you don't have the growth in the summer. But if we go to the East Coast, this was a study done at University of Georgia where there was eight tons of carbon per hectare per year. So that starts to jump some ideas where we do have moisture, we can put carbon away. And this is David Johnson's miraculous discussion to us in trying to get us to shift our paradigms. So that starts to up the ante tremendously about how fast we can begin to move our sequestration levels, build biodiversity, build water percolation, uh, improve our water cycles, our carbon cycles, and our nutrient cycles. So in essence, we really do focus out here and say uh, David Johnson's work that has been substantiated as he showed us, oh, that's my cover crop, just to show you, that's just rain fed, and I'm knocking it down last year, waiting for the rains this year, so I haven't even put the seed in the ground. They're coming a little bit later. But this is the kind of biomass that David's talking about, and I haven't yet put his compost on my land. Um, so we'll see. If my comp you know, I got to tell you a story, David. This could create a problem for me because before I knocked this down, I had some neighbors walking by, and in California, worried about fires, and they go, boy, you have a weed problem. <laughs> and I said, but look, I, and I told them my multi-species, I was telling them what each species did, they're giving me this blank stare. And as they're giving me this blank stare, uh, a father is riding his bicycle, his son's on his bicycle, and the son says, boy, Dad, you wouldn't let your weeds get that tall, would you? <laughs> so we have a... Uh, uh, DD, I didn't let peer pressure get to me. I stayed with it, all right? I just stayed with it anyway and rolled it down. So what David shows us is that there are, there are some truth sort of gaining results where farmers get 22.63 tons. David made this slide of carbon per hectare per year, and that's kinds of robust levels that should give us such tremendous hope if we didn't have humans to work with. But we do. And we have to go move into the adoption theory. How do we get the shift in adoption theory? Well, this is why I come to the organic world, being an organic grower, eater, believer, proponent. Have we succeeded in the organic movement? It's been here 93 years, one per, less than 1% of the farmland. That's probably a pretty big, dismal failure. And we have to ask why. Why has it not? Uh, taken hold if it's so good and you know and we could get into that there's a lot of discussion points I think on that but when I, in 2008 I wrote that we could sequester it all there's only one thing I'd really change about those white papers today and that is as I would drop organic out of the discussion and the reason is that it's a communication barrier so just like Dee Dee talked about peer pressure most farmers in this country are not organophiles. As a matter of fact, you're some lippy, hippie liberal from California, and we, we're not like you. So it creates barrier and discussion and risk and peer pressure. And even uh, Nature's Path told me, uh, Aaron Stevens told me once, they had a farmer in his second year of transition moving into his third, and he stopped at the coffee shop and his neighbor farmer said, hey, Bill, I see some weeds in your field. And he dropped out right there, back to the peer pressure. So we've got to get away from this and think in terms of how do we communicate, not with the word climate change, not with the word organic to most of our farmers. And these kind of guys are the ones that are the messengers, Ray Archuleta and Gabe Brown, that can do it because they don't come with that baggage. They come with, I think it's good baggage, but it's baggage, and we've got to eliminate that and put our pride to the side because we need to invite all farmers into this engagement right now. On an international level, this is the guy that taught me that you could build over an inch, probably two inches of topsoil a year in the tropical regions, and that's putting carbon down there like nobody's business. We have no measurements on those. We don't know how much that is, but we know it's mostly carbon, for 50% of it anyway, that's going into that system. And so it's a tremendous number. Of that, had we changed the way smallholders and farmers in those regions farm, we can really make a tremendous difference. This is Kofi Boa in one of my maize fields in, in uh, Africa as we were doing some teaching. And 
how he met Howard Buffett was he was a, a Nebraska Cornhusker in his graduate degree, and they met in Ghana, and Howard invested in him, and he's doing a tremendous job. Both of these guys are converting tens of thousands of farmers, smallholder farmers in Africa and South America uh, towards very regenerative practices. He is wearing a LaSalle hat there, but I, I tell you, it's a great advantage if you um, have a university that shares your name because they have apparel and you can just give it away, you know? <laughs> so w what happens is, is that um, photosynthesis maximization, a little bit what David was telling us about in carbon capture, if we stack practices like I was doing here in this experiment using a, a Makuna bush bean to, to create more photosynthetic capacity on the same plot of land and returning nitrogen and biomass at the same time. I hadn't yet met this Johnson character who was going to teach me about this biological inoculation, and it would have been pretty interesting to see what kinds of yields and shifts we could have made with that process. So we can do this technologically, but Dr. Robert Sodello was in my home a couple years ago. We were having dinner, and he was saying, what are you doing? I was telling about all this, all excited. He said, great thinking. It won't work. I said, why? He said, you forgot the human equation. And that's where we find ourselves. So here's the depth psychological lens. James Hillman said, you know what? In essence, psychology, unless it really comes to deal with the environment and becomes ecological, is of little value. And we actually have to incorporate ourselves back into our natural environment. And that's not only healing, but it creates a relational opportunity for our psyche or our soul, and we'll use that interchangeably, to begin to engage that with which we depend on. James Hollis, who I respect a lot, but I questioned him once, as I went to one of his workshops, and he was, he's a young in who was talking about particularly trauma and particularly helping people. Uh, he had, he had, I said, Dr. Hollis, I said, look, I said, we're talking about all our personal wounds while the planet's dying. And don't we need to be doing something about that instead as a higher priority? And he said, you've got to understand, people are wounded and that pain is foremost. Well, I'd love to spend another week with him in that discussion, but I think that's where a lot of psychology lives, is in the personal wounds and personal pains. But one of the things he says at the bottom of this slide, which isn't showing up on here for some reason so much, is that what persists in us becomes a haunting. And what has haunted me is the hungry faces and the swollen bellies I've seen, the degraded earth that I've seen, and the climate stress that I have seen and experienced. And that haunts me every day. And that's a psychological haunting for sure, but it also gets me out of bed. Adam was saying last night, I go to bed to feel defeated, and we've lost this game, and every morning get up and say, let's go get them. And that's kind of where I think we find ourselves. Well, let me just say what happens with regard to our human psyche is that so much of our psychological education, and this one I'm going to posit the depth realm, is based upon ego, and it's based upon ego and consciousness. But there's a great psychologist said, you know, in the West, the ego and the consciousness have fused and become self-referential and ignored the unconscious part of our whole psyche, the feminine side to it. And so what has happened in this regard here as human, and particularly in an academic institution, our rewards are for our thinking function, not our feeling function. Our rewards are for our rationalism, not our intuition. And our, our rewards then leave us disconnected, not connected. And that's a part that the depth realms can bring us back into. One of the reasons I put this graphic piece together is much of our religion trains us, if you are into that discussion that a soul resides within us. But if you really look at our construct, our ego and our consciousness lives within this bigger arena of the whole psyche. And let me just make this point to you. While in Africa, one night in the middle of the night, I got up to pee. You know, prostates and older men. And as I get up, I didn't turn the lights on to wake my wife up. And so I walked into the bathroom barefooted and stepped on a snake. Well, I'm not that afraid of snakes, but this is Africa. Most of them are deadly. There are four varieties of cobras. There's uh, puff adders that don't even move, and they just love to bite you. I could go on and on. Uh, the black mamba, 
you can have nightmares about because it can outrun you. I mean, it, these are scary guys. When I ran onto a python, I jumped out and wanted to hug it. You're not poisonous, you know? Um, but I stepped on a Mozambican spitting cobra, the second most deadliest snake in South Africa. Uh, Providence or something uh, saved me, but it wasn't my rational brain. If you step on a very poisonous snake, are you going to think that process through? <laughs> I was into that bathtub in the dark faster than I could have ever rationally thought my way there. Just to show you how our unconscious is in more control than we think and makes more choices for us on a daily moment, second basis than we ever give it credit to. So what happens is, is we're living a pathology of normal. Much of psychology tries to get us back to normal. What in the world are we doing in our culture that's helpful? It's sick, man. We are destroying the planet, over consuming everything, and supporting success as the faster car, the bigger house, more consumptive approach. So it is a pathological directional flow. So what we do with that you mentioned the other day about we have to, psychologically, we use denial as a way to live with trauma, pain, but also to distance ourselves from what it is we're doing to each other and to the planet. And denial is a psychological defense mechanism which is working against us with regard to this. We also have psychic numbing, which Robert Lifton wrote about, particularly in studying the Nazi doctors, and how did they get up every day, go to the killing systems that they developed in the concentration camps, and come back and pet their dog and love their family, and call that normal, a normalization. Well, actually, we've done that in this country with certain cultures. We do that every day as we're killing biodiversity and yet go back to our homes and our NFL on Sunday and normalizing ourselves and numbing ourselves to actually our involvement in this process. We have this lack of the feminine and what I want to say about this is, is that we are in a control. Our myths take us into a control and domination. The way we translate the Bible is to control nature to be responsible or in for our use, nature, instead of a relational peace that comes in and begins to engage it more in a way of reverence, more in a way of honoring, that would give us a better chance for survival today. And our cultural complexes, there's multiple levels of these cultural complexes. We have all of our own personal psychological complexes that mostly goes unrecognized in our psyches for our lifetime. But also we have it culturally. And you have to do a lot of analysis to get to the bottom of some of your personal. In our own culture, we wouldn't have to do as much because we can start to see what water as a fish we're immersed in that we can't see normally that is destructive. And these complexes support destruction and we help fuel them in our daily actions. There are many more things we could go in from a depth psychological perspective. I'd love to have a discussion on liberation psychology, of liberating some of these ideas and thoughts that culture has given to us. We have a Thanatos drive, a little bit of a death drive in our drive for life, but it also exists on an unconscious level. We're acting that out bigger than we admit uh, collectively. We have a loss of the sacred. Uh, uh, and a failure of eco-psychology, which is a whole other discussion eco-psychologists would not like to hear me talk about. But what I wanted to offer is to say, if we look at our whole psyche and we think in terms, okay, now what do you do? And a lot of people always say, so what? What do we do? You've just left me with desperate discussions with no way out. And problematically, it's a huge challenge for us because it takes some deep reorientation in the way of being, and I'm saying that more than just the way of thinking. It's not just a cognitive avoidance, it's not just a cognitive let's get our attention to, it's a way of being. And one is, we have to have enough ego strength to suffer marginalization, and this is where psychologists say, see, you need us, we've got to help be, build your ego strength. Well, the ego is a two-edged sword, out of control, 
you get in the White House. Um, and, I, and I think we can use that as an example the, of, of how it can get out of control and become very pathological. Uh, but in fact, to suffer the marginalization, it's like where David lives in the research world is to suffer marginalization. He's not marginalized in an audience like this, but with regard to the mainstream, he gets marginalized, and he has to be willing to suffer that to continue that work. And I know many of you have lived in that framing. And we have to be able to suffer marginalization because as we speak up and make changes, drive to get more organic farms, all, some of the work that you're doing, Didi, and some of you in this audience, you have been willing, you're strong enough to do that. We need those 79,000. Adam, we need a lot more people who will do this and step forward. Second is, we need to be willing to suffer the initiation of the dream of the end of the world. Uh, it's actually an initiation. And it's funny, when I read this by this author, Hill, I read it the morning I had awakened from a dream where I was caught in a room with a snake that was poisonous. This was before I stepped on that one in Africa. <laughs> and in that dream, speaking of my unconscious, I said in that dream, I better let that snake bite me. I need the initiation. And then I get up and read this author that's saying we have to suffer actually the dream of the end of the world for us to be able to act effectively and know that it sits in front of us and that we're going to have to get extremely creative and co-join our efforts across political boundaries, across gender roles, across ethnic differences, and across national boundaries to make this one work. And then a return of the sacred and reverential and the reverential, where our story becomes once again immersed basically into the fabric of creation instead of separate from. And this is where our myth at our basic underlying unconscious sense of who we are in this space needs a reorientation. And this is more than cognitive because it has to come on the felt level as well. And so, basically, those of us with grandchildren sit here thinking in terms of the legacies that we're leaving, the cultures we're immersing them into, the stories that we're telling them, the education that they're being uh, exposed to, the aspirations that are being interjected into them, and how do we create the kind of culture, psyche, and soul in us as a species that becomes reverential and relational. And I offer that without that element, all of the science, all of the logic, all of the rational discussions we may have will not get us where we need to be. With that, I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to working with you on that topic.